In the early 1900s, the world, and especially Europe, was changing. Industrialization was in full swing, and ideologies like socialism and communism were gaining popularity amongst the working class who demanded better working conditions and, in the case of communists and socialists, outright ownership of the means of production, with the core concept being a sort of democratized economy, with common ownership of industry rather than private capital owners running the show. Some wanted to achieve it through revolution, others through gradual reform. There was also much more to the story. Authoritarian forms of government, like in Tsarist Russia, were gradually going out of style in Europe, following the Enlightenment a century prior. These ideas, as we know, led to great societal changes throughout the 1900s, and one of the most significant ones was the Russian Revolution and later October Revolution that created the Soviet Union. While these events are often simplified in history class for ease of understanding, the Russian Revolution wasn't just one event that suddenly turned Tsarist Russia into the Bolshevik-led Soviet Union. First, unrest in Tsarist Russia led to several reforms, such as the establishment of an elected assembly of political parties, the Duma. Georgi Levov was also appointed prime minister. The Duma and elected government were, however, mostly symbolic, and Nicholas II, Tsar of Russia, generally remained an absolute monarch. This lack of serious reform, combined with food shortages and Russia not performing great during World War I, led to protests. Nicholas tried to put them down with the army, which promptly mutinied. Nicholas then abdicated, and a provisional government was set up under the prime minister. This all sounds great. Russia finally became democratic as the elected Duma would have real power, and socialists among the population were now actually represented by political parties with actual power. But as you may have heard earlier, not all socialists and communists were reformist in nature. Many were, but not all. Vladimir Lenin and like-minded people turned the Petrograd Soviet into a rival government that challenged the legitimacy of the provisional government in Moscow and called for it to be overthrown, skipping over several important events. Lenin and his Bolshevik faction managed to violently overthrow the provisional government. This was the October Revolution, or October Coup. After this overthrow, Lenin and his government moved to end the war with the Central Powers. Many did want out of the war, which was a big reason why Lenin managed to garner support in the first place. But not all were happy with the humiliating defeat, and many didn't want to recognize the overthrow of the provisional government. This led to the Russian Civil War, which as we know, the Soviets won. But what if that hadn't happened? What if the provisional government survived? In this scenario, the October coup simply does not happen. Let's say Lenin and other prominent Bolsheviks die before they get the chance, or are never let back into Russia. This doesn't mean there is no socialist movement in Russia. There definitely would be. It would just be reformist in nature like modern socialist and social democratic parties all over Europe. With this, the provisional government in Moscow could successfully establish the Russian Democratic Federal Republic, or just the Russian Republic or Russian Federation for short. This changes the outcome of the First World War greatly. Instead of surrendering to the Central Powers in March 1918 and then being embroiled in civil war, Russia stays in the war a few more months till the armistice in November. The front lines would remain roughly the same throughout the last few months as they had been since 1917, and Russia would end up at the negotiating table along with the rest of the Allied powers. Russia would be granted some of the territories it occupied in the east of Turkey, which would become parts of the new Armenian and Georgian People's Republics within the larger Russian Federation. With the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II, there would no longer be a legal basis for the personal union between Russia and Finland, but Russia would certainly not be keen on having an international border so close to one of its most important cities, Petrograd, or St. Petersburg as we know it. Even with democracy, Russian imperialism certainly wouldn't be going anywhere. The government in Moscow would continue negotiations with Finland, which had been going on even during the war, and likely end in a compromise where Finland would be granted some minor territories and a great deal more autonomy than other republics within the Russian Federation. With this status, they would be mostly self-governing, but Russia would remain in charge of foreign policy and military matters. Other regions granted this semi-autonomous status would include the Baltic states, and also Poland, which much like Finland would be granted some territories in exchange for remaining within the Russian Federation. The Balkans would be carved up much like in our world, although with Russia setting up a sphere of influence there through puppet regimes and military alliances, the Balkan countries in this scenario also continue to look to Russia as their defender, as they had for centuries prior. The main reason Russia lost that role in the eyes of many in the Balkans in the first place was the establishment of the Soviet Union. 
further east, Turkey, like in our world, would reject the harsh demands put on them, and the Turkish war for independence would ensue. With the military genius Mustafa Kemal Ataturk still at the helm, Turkey would likely manage to avoid complete disintegration as in our world, although with Russian involvement in the east, they would have to make some territorial concessions, like an independent Kurdistan under British influence, and recognition of the larger Armenian and Georgian People's Republics just to the north. With there being no looming threat of communist uprisings, and with socialism in general being a much more reformist movement, there wouldn't be nearly as strong a reactionary movement as we saw in our world. Americans wouldn't gasp at the word socialism, and fascism would be much more of a fringe ideology, never rising to prominence in Germany as in our world. This obviously also means no Second World War, making the 1900s very different. Germany would still see some form of resurgence in the 1930s, which the British and French would allow as they did in the real world under appeasement and because a weak Germany might be seen as too vulnerable to Russian domination. This might even go as far as to allow German remilitarization of the Rhineland and unification with Austria under an actual referendum. But without an extreme figure like Adolf, that would be the end of it. Mussolini still rises to power in Italy. He would support the nationalists in the Spanish Civil War, but they would lose without German support, making Italy isolated and unable to find allies in Europe. Italy's expansionist goals in Europe would simply be unachievable with the Balkans under the Russian sphere of influence. In Africa, however, Italy would make some gains like Ethiopia as they did in our world. Italy in this scenario would be a bit of a mix of our world's Portuguese empire and nationalist Spain. It would be an isolated authoritarian state for the better part of the century, desperately fighting to keep its empire till the bitter end. By the 70s or 80s, the costly wars in their colonies and lackluster standards of living caused by Italy's isolation would result in a revolution as the authoritarian government loses popular support. Italy would lose all of its colonies and regions like northern Tyrol and Istria would demand unification with Germany and Yugoslavia. Italy would struggle for the following decades but recovers as it joins the European community and sees more economic growth. Yugoslavia, like in our world, would certainly struggle to keep itself together, but with Russia supporting the central government, there are no Yugoslav wars, as regional leaders know full well that declaring independence means declaring war on Russia. In the East, China would still end up under nationalist control, but with revolutionary communism never being as prominent an ideology, it remains that way. Japan would still be expansionist in the late 30s and 40s, leading to a major war in Asia and the Pacific. Japan would lose to the US obviously, although I could also see Russia getting involved and taking the opportunity to conquer Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands, as well as liberating parts of China and Korea, gaining two important East Asian allies. The Russian Federation in this scenario would be nothing like the Soviet Union or even modern Russian Federation that isn't really a democracy whatsoever that we know from the real world. It would undoubtedly still have a fairly strong central government, but one made up of actual elected officials from different political parties. Communists, socialists, and social democrats would still be prominent in Russian politics, they just wouldn't run the whole show. I think they would manage to implement a lot of socialist policy, but not nearly to the same extent as in the Soviet Union. They would not manage to get rid of private ownership of land entirely, but they would probably be able to implement something akin to the Nordic model or the healthcare industry, and many companies are partially or fully nationalized and run by the elected government rather than private corporations. They may even manage to take it a step further and end up with an economic model close to something like China has in our world, with even more companies being state-owned whilst not entirely abolishing private ownership and remaining a democracy, avoiding a lot of the glaring issues in China. Considering how successful the social democratic model in the Nordic countries has been, and how much China managed to grow with their economic model where private capital owners have even less of a say in the economy, I think this Russia, with a more reformist, socialist, and social democratic movement that doesn't just throw the whole system out the window on day one, could be very successful. Russia in the early 1900s was a rising power rapidly industrializing with vast, resource-rich lands to develop, much like the United States. They were in a perfect position to become a wealthy superpower. They certainly became the latter in our world, but bad policy under Soviet rule had held them back, especially when it came to standards of living. In this world, the Russian Federation would by the 80s have a larger population than the US and could potentially even rival them economically. And without the same population collapse in the 1990s, they would remain a relevant power on par with the US for the foreseeable future perhaps even with standards of living comparable to that of modern developed countries, or at least close to it. 
This obviously has massive implications. With Russia industrializing and becoming ever more powerful, there would still be some fears in Europe as the power gap between Germany and Russia increases to the point where Germany can no longer really rival the titan that is Russia on its own. Even without a big scary ideology to fear, geopolitics and rivaling spheres of influence aren't going anywhere. This might lead to some sort of NATO-esque defense pact in Europe but one that is more German and French-led than American-led, as the US is much less involved in European politics and generally just has less influence in Europe without World War II and the Marshall Plan. With the eastern half of Europe creating one giant Russian-led bloc, it might even lead to economic pacts akin to the early European coal and steel community and eventual European Union. Again, so the rest of Europe isn't just completely steamrolled by the rise of Russia throughout the 1900s. China would probably develop earlier in this timeline, copying this world's Russian social democratic model. It also wouldn't have had nearly as inflated a population due to policies enacted by the CCP in our timeline. It would not be facing a demographic crisis today, simply a more lackluster birth rate like other developed economies. The 1900s in this world would not be seen as this two-way cold war and battle of ideologies as we saw in the real world. It would rather be much more like the balance of power seen in Europe pre-World War I. Russia and China would eventually grow to become powers equal to the US, and if intergovernmental organizations in Western Europe succeed, a Franco-German-led Europe would also stand as its own power. I think this world would be much more stable and peaceful than our own, as there wouldn't be the same ideologically driven proxy wars. China, Russia, the US, and European bloc would certainly compete for influence across the world, but more often through economic means. They would all also have some form of democracy, so people would have much more of a say over how they are governed across the world as autocratic forms of government really have no legitimacy in this scenario and are seen as a relic of the past. It is possible some alternate World War II breaks out between any of these powers, but with the eventual advent of nuclear weapons, which all of them would certainly acquire, I doubt it. But that's about all for now. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this in the future. Thank you to all my channel members, and a special thank you to my second tier member, Lara Hino. See you all in my next video.